Thousands of North Korean troops being used to bolster Russian forces in Ukraine show Vladimir Putin's desperation to compensate for losses on the front line. Putin's forces are believed to be losing hundreds of troops a day, with Ukrainian estimates going as high as 1,200 to 1,500, so the more than 10,000 troops South Korea believes are in Russia would last two weeks or so at that rate. The troops are already under fire, being shelled in the Russian border region of Kursk, According to Kyiv, that is the area where Ukrainian troops have held territory, having started a daring raid in August. North Korean soldiers are now in place, mainly in locations around Russia's Kursk region where Ukrainian forces have captured some Russian territory and that the troops have already suffered combat casualties. North Korean mothers who sent their children to Russia must feel unimaginable pain, said Kim Jong-ah, a North Korean defector and former first lieutenant in the North Korean People's Army who spoke to VOA Korean. It drives you crazy. How else can you express that feeling? Said Kim, herself a mother who now runs a non-profit in Seoul that promotes women's rights in North Korea. They cannot even cry as hard as you want at home because there's no soundproof walls between houses. Kim, who escaped North Korea in 2009, said the families of those North Korean soldiers in Russia must be suffering without being able to express their grievances due to pressure from the North Korean regime. It is widely believed that the Kim Jong-un regime mobilized its elite Storm Corps special forces to support Russia. Lee hyun Sung, a former soldier in the Storm Corps unit and an SKP who now lives in the US, told VOA Korean, that the North Korean regime does not inform families of overseas deployments, unit locations or personal safety issues for fear of leaking military secrets. Lee suggested that news of the deployment is likely already spreading by word of mouth among residents and that there will certainly be internal opposition among residents to this clear violation of human rights, deploying the troops without notice to the families. Rumors will spread quickly and if the families who were not aware of the deployment find out their sons were sacrificed, this will be a huge blow to the regime. In a recent talk hosted by the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, Tae Yong-ho, former North Korean diplomat who served in South Korea's National Assembly after his defection, said although Pyongyang is keeping the deployment secret, North Korean troop fatalities will be hard to keep from public view. Tae also said that North Korea has a very low birth rate, with families having only one or two children, so parents will not be able to accept the fact that their children died defending Russia, not their own country. Correspondent Bjorn Stridzel, who visited Ukrainian positions near the city of Taretsk, says the Ukraine has recently introduced the use of massive 2S7 Pion self-propelled artillery system into its armed forces, according to BUILD. Taretsk, a Ukrainian stronghold since Russia's first invasion of Donbass in 2014, is a strategically important settlement. Control of the city would give Russian forces a foothold to advance further into Ukrainian-held territory in Donetsk Oblast a key objective in their military campaign. A 2S7 Pion self-propelled artillery system weighs 60 tons and has a 12-meter barrel. This is the heaviest operational cannon in the world. It was developed by the USSR in the 1960s for destroying concrete fortifications of the enemy. The Pion requires 203 millimeter caliber projectiles, each weighing 100 kilograms. The publication notes that by spring 2022, the Ukrainian forces had quickly depleted their Soviet-supplied ammunition stockpiles, which led to the withdrawal of these self-propelled artillery systems from the front line. Recently, the U.S. provided the necessary projectiles. The U.S. had produced them in the 1950s and 60s for their M110 and M115 howitzers. The 2S7 Pion main armament consists of a 2A44 203mm cannon, the 203mm barrel has an overall length of 56.5 calibers and weighs a total of 7,800 kilograms and has a barrel life of about 450 rounds. When traveling, the 203mm cannon is held in position by a manually operated travel lock mounted on top of the cab. Gun elevation, traverse, loading and operation of the spade are all hydraulic with manual controls for emergency use. Mounted at the very rear of the tracked 
chassis is a large recoil spade that, when lowered to the ground, provides stability during firing. The gun operator is seated at the rear of the vehicle on the left side and for the engagement of targets has a standard PG-1M panoramic day telescope that is used in conjunction with the K1 collimator. Ammunition is of the separate loading type, projectile and charge with a maximum muzzle velocity of 960M-S. The maximum range using unassisted ammunition is 37.5 kilometers. The standard 203 mm HE round is designated ZOF 43 and weighs 110 kilograms with a total of four projectiles and charges being carried on the 2S7 for immediate use. The remainder of the ammunition load is carried by another vehicle, usually a truck. In addition, there is a rocket-assisted high-explosive projectile that weighs 103 kilograms and has a maximum range of 47,500 M. The 2S7 is also able to fire chemical and nuclear shells. On the turret's front, Ukrainian artillery personnel fire the pion even before receiving the order to shoot. The pion must reach its operating temperature, explained Ukrainian officer Rostislav. Once the order is given, the artillery units quickly emerge from their shelter and position the pion on the firing point. The retractable spade is deployed, pressing into the ground to absorb the powerful recoil. When the pion fires, the earth around shakes. Stritzel noted. Recently, Russian President Vladimir Putin and the heads of Russia's three largest oil companies rejected a proposal to merge into one large structure. The talk is about the merger of two state-owned companies, Gazpromneft and Rosneft, with Lukoil. The Financial Times reports, the source writes that the head of the Russian Ministry of Energy, Sergei Tsivilev, the husband of Putin's cousin, is in favor of such a merger. At the same time, former heads of Russian oil companies stated that such a merger would give state companies access to Look Oil's trading division in the UAE. However, the Kremlin understands that all Russian oil companies would then fall under sanctions. The merger was first announced on November the 9th. However, the Kremlin and oil companies declined to comment. Conflicting reports about a proposed merger of a Russian oil company highlight potential factional fighting between Putin's cronies and the heads of Russian energy companies. Sivilev tried to use his family connections to promote the idea of merging the three companies. However, the oil company's management also used its leverage in the Kremlin. Rosneft CEO Sechin and Gazprom CEO Miller are longtime and close friends of Putin. The latter had to decline Sivilev's offer, although Putin himself was interested in such a merger. Then the Kremlin would be able to control the entire oil-producing industry of the Russian Federation without any problems. Experts do not rule out that such a merger was aimed exclusively against Sechin in order to weaken his role in the company. Others claim that it was he who insisted on the merger in order to later become the CEO of all three Russian oil companies. The press service of Rosneft denies Sechin's evil intentions. Earlier, media reported that Russian oligarchs are concerned about Trump coming to power in the United States. Russian oligarchs do not share the joy of some of their compatriots over Donald Trump's victory in the U.S. elections and do not believe that the elected American president will lift the sanctions imposed against Russia, just as they do not believe in a quick end to the war in Ukraine. In this regard, they do not see prospects for optimism in the Russian economy, pointing to its significant change over the full-scale invasion of Ukraine, which makes long-term goals unattainable. Due to the departure of international companies from Russia, the Russian economy is experiencing a degradation of production capacity, especially in the technology and engineering sectors. The Kremlin's declared import substitution is proceeding slowly and sending Russians to war is exacerbating the labor shortage.